Thanks so much for joining us this evening. This is our fifth in our menopause series of Restless Presents with our partners, My Menopause Centre. And as Helen said, we're looking at alternatives to HRT this time. Um, so before I hand back over to Helen, who will chair this evening's event, I wanted to remind you of a couple of housekeeping points. Please post your questions, and we love your questions and thoughts in the chat function at the bottom of your screens. And feel free to post throughout the presentation, and we'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. There will also be time for questions at the end of the event. Um, we are recording the event, and it will be mailed out to anyone who's registered this evening, along with links to any other resources that are relevant. Um, and it will also be available to view on our YouTube channel, as well as within the menopause section of Restless. So I'd like to hand over now to our panel chair, Helen Nomoyle, who is co-founder of My Menopause Centre. Helen has held chief marketing officer roles across the healthcare, beauty, broadcast, furniture and property sectors, and is a self-described women's wellness champion. Over to you, Helen. Brilliant. Thanks, AD, and good evening, everyone. Now, as you'll know from the invite we sent out for this event, for most women, most of the time, HRT is one of the most effective ways of managing menopause symptoms, and it has well-documented long-term protective health benefits too. But what if HRT simply isn't <coughs> important for you? Or what if you find that while it's really helpful, it's still not quite enough to help you feel like you again, and you want to boost it with something else? So what then are the alternatives to HRT? That's a question that we're asked time and time again, and particularly Dr. Claire and the doctors in our clinic. And it's the reason we're holding tonight's event. Now, the really good news is there are lots of alternative options which can support us, whatever our personal menopausal journeys, but it can be a bit of a minefield. Knowing what works and what's worth spending money on can be confusing. Now, in January, we ran a free event looking at lifestyle, namely nutrition, diet and exercise, because these really are the foundations of good health. And the video of the event and related articles and blogs are on our website. And Emma, our social, media, our social media manager, is going to post links to them in a moment in the chat. As you'll hear from Claire, CBT coaching, counseling, and sex and relationship therapy can also be of great benefit depending on your symptoms. And we've run some events for those as well. And Emma will also post links to them. So in this evening's panel, we're going to focus on three specific alternatives. Prescribable alternatives to HRT, acupuncture and supplements. And we'll look at the evidence for each. Now, as Aideen says, feel free to put your questions and your comments in the chat as we go along. Given the number of people on the webinar, we can't promise to get to each one, but we'll do our utmost to do so and link to relevant resources. Now, before we kick off, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panel of experts. Of course, our co-founder at My Menopause Centre, Dr. Claire Spencer, a GP and brilliant menopause specialist, and a passionate advocate for women's health and training of GPs in this area. Dr. Carolyn Edelson, who is very uniquely, she's a registered doctor, a traditional acupuncturist, and a British Acupuncture Council member. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And David Ferrelli. David is a registered pharmacist. He has trained and practiced in Italy before moving to England a few years ago. And he's now a registered pharmacist here in England and practices as a pharmacist in London. He's also a nutritional consultant, a herbalist, and member of the Association of Naturopathic Practitioners. Good evening, David. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Um, so, Claire, we're going to start with you and the prescribable HRT alternatives that you can get from your GP. But it would be great to hear, based on your extensive experience in this area, why some women can't take HRT and why others of your patients that you see don't really want to take it. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think it's important to say that HRT doesn't suit everybody. Um, so even though you might be taking the sort of nicest body identical, bioidentical hormones, um, sometimes people just don't tolerate them, even in low doses, um, particularly the progesterone or progesterone aspect of it. Um, 
some people some some people just don't want to take hrt they just don't they want to do everything naturally they just want to feel how their body transitions through the menopause which is absolutely fine they you know they just want to know where they're at and they don't want the hrt to mask it um i think there are still a, a percentage of women who don't really know very much about hrt who don't understand what it is and who may still view it with a little bit of suspicion and i definitely think there is still anxiety surrounding hrt and particularly in terms of the risk albeit small risk of breast cancer and um, you know i hear from women still that they'd say that they're still too frightened um, to take it. I spoke to somebody um, last week who'd adopted some children and didn't want to take HRT because she didn't want to jeopardize anything that could potentially impact her health. So it's really the conversation about understanding the risks and benefits. I think that there's still a lot of anxiety. And then, you know, some women will have been advised not to take HRT medically um, because it will be perceived as being too risky for them because of underlying medical conditions. Um, I'm still thinking um, around, for example, breast cancer and other cancers that can be hormone dependent. So a huge variety of symptoms, uh, a huge variety of reasons. And Claire, it's really helpful to hear that because there's been a huge amount of coverage about HRT over recent months and particularly around the shortages. Um, and I suppose the key thing is that every woman does what she believes is right for her and that feels under pressure one way or the other. Look at the evidence and, you know, with guidance from great doctors like yourself, uh, decide what's right for you. But with, with, with that said, um, for some women, for those women who just can't take HRT, for reasons maybe around cancer or others, what are the prescribable alternatives that you recommend in your clinic and what symptoms can they help with? Yes, yeah, no, and that's a brilliant point, Helen. You know, the, you are at the centre of this. This is not one size fits all, and my job is to present the evidence for each option. So in terms of what a doctor can prescribe that isn't HRT, so the only licensed medication, that means it's got a license for this purpose, is a drug called clonidine. Clonidine is actually a blood pressure tablet and is licensed for the treatment of hot flushes. And, you know, it can be really effective if you are having a hot flush every 30 minutes. It can definitely help a percentage of women. You just have to watch out for side effects, particularly dizziness, dry mouth, and a doctor would be able to talk you through that and check your own blood pressure before you start it. And then there's a whole bunch of unlicensed medications. So that means that they're designed for other purposes, but we know that there is evidence that they can help with menopause symptoms. So two medications that are similar, gabapentin and pregabalin, can take the edge off hot flushes, can help sleep, if migraine are an issue, they can help migraine. They're medications that are often used for sort of nerve pain or more complicated medical conditions, but they have a place to play. Um, and then there's antidepressants, which many, many women, as we increasingly hear, have been offered um, often before HRT. They do support that, you know, they can be helpful. Um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor types of HRT and the similar ones, S, S, N, so S, N, R, I, can be helpful in knocking the edge off hot flushes and then bolstering the mood, taking the edge off anxiety. Um, you just have to be a little bit careful with antidepressants if you are taking tamoxifen, because some of them can mean that tamoxifen becomes less effective. Um, but, you know, they definitely have a place to play, particularly if you can't or don't want to take HRT. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Now, we had some questions submitted in advance. I'm just going to jump in with a few of them here. And I can see from the chat they relate to some of the questions that, that have popped up as well. So um, st starting off with vaginal atrophy, um, mm. can, can you take a vaginal estrogen if you've had cancer or breast cancer? Or are, and are there non-HRT alternatives to help with vaginal atrophy? Yes, no, absolutely. So many women who have or even undergoing treatment for breast cancer tan, can use a vaginal estrogen. Although the evidence is, there is incomplete, shall I say, there isn't a lot of evidence for safety 
actually the evidence that we have got indicates to the fact that a vaginal estrogen won't increase your risk of recurrence of breast cancer or impact on treatment. So a vaginal estrogen is increasingly becoming an option. But if you don't want to, or you've been advised not to because of other treatment that you're taking, um, then there are good non-hormonal alternatives. So a vaginal moisturizer. So there are a plethora there sort of protein gels that you put directly into the vagina and they just act to try and hold the moisture against the vaginal walls and lubrication as well. Um, th there are lots of good lubrication um, uh, treatments out there. We recommend the Yes Yes products, but there's silk, um, Jurex make one. Um, so there definitely are alternatives, but do particularly asking a menopause specialist or a cancer specialist about whether you can use a vaginal estrogen is an option. Yeah. Th that, that is really clear, clear, and that is super help helpful. Now, we also had a question around um, uh, loss of libido and, um, and loss of sex drive propping up here this, this evening. One of the questions was, is there a version of Viagra for women? Um, so um, I guess there's a couple of questions wrapped up on that. Um, is testosterone an option if you've had any type of cancer? And are there non-HRT, uh, non-hormone um, recommendations, alternatives that people can take to boost their sex drive? Oh, yeah. If there was a female, female Viagra, we'd be, yeah, well away, we would be. Um, there isn't a magic bullet for libido, unfortunately. Um, so as Helen said earlier, we, we have run a couple of events now on libido and menopause with sex therapists. And that's probably the most magic bullet that you can get. Wouldn't you agree, Helen, from everything we've heard about going back to the drawing board with your partner, just having a little rethink about what you're doing, owning your sexuality and thinking what you really want. It's difficult if you don't feel sexual at all, particularly if you are going through cancer treatment and working with a counsellor can be extremely helpful, I think, in addressing a lot of those issues. Um, testosterone can be helpful for libido, not for everybody who takes it. And um, specifically to answer your question, whether testosterone can be used in women who have breast cancer, it's likely from the limited data that we have that it doesn't increase the risk of recurrence but of breast cancer, but that data is limited. And it's definitely worth a conversation. It's worth bearing in mind that if you use testosterone without HRT, some of it is converted to estrogen. And so I think the conversation is very individual as to what symptoms a woman is experiencing and it really needs to be with an experienced menopause specialist or oncologist and taken into account with your own cancer diagnosis also it's not straightforward but it, it, it's often not a definite no yeah brilliant that's really clear as well and I know Emma will be posting links to those events and to We've got some great blogs and videos about lubrication, about sex toys, sex and relationship therapy. So um, hopefully uh, folks will find that useful. And um, we did an event with Josh Wood, um, the, the um, brilliant colorist and, and stylist uh, last week. Somebody has a question about hair loss. So if we, we got some great um, uh, feedback on that, but Claire, do you want to give a quick recap on your thoughts on, because this again, a question, that you get from a lot of women that you see uh, because you yeah. know our, our hair our, our hair is so much part of our identity oh it's absolutely is hair loss and the menopause is really complicated it's often not just the hormones it's often whether you're genetically sort of programmed to have hair loss as your hormone balances change and as you gain years actually there are other medical conditions it's worth just checking out. So having a good ferritin or iron level is really important. The dermatologists say of around 75, which is actually quite high. Um, so the hair loss is tricky. HRT can help sometimes. There are some supplements that the, the evidence isn't great for any of it, if I'm totally honest. It is complicated, which is why Josh Wood's um, Instagram chat with you, Helen, was so useful because he talked a lot about um, what you can do cosmetically to make your hair look thicker. 
Um, so I'd urge you to have a read of the information. It, it is quite complicated, but can be devastating um, yeah. when hair is lost. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Now, the questions are coming in thick and fast. There's a number in here about um, supplements, and um, we'll hold those for when we speak to David. We've got some questions in here around acupuncture, and we'll definitely come to those um, when when we uh, speak to Carla in, in just a moment. But, but Claire, um, there's some questions relating to this next question as well. So when you think about the questions you get asked most often by your patients about the things that they can do or take instead of or alongside HRT or these prescribable alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I'll call out some of the things that have come through in the chat. Weight loss, for example, um, is, is one that comes up. Energy levels, somebody wants to know what else can they do apart from taking testosterone to help boost their energy. Uh, and one of the questions we had in advance around what, what this lady wanted to know, what could she do when she thinks about um, preventative health around uh, osteoporosis, um, cardiovascular disease, uh, cognitive function and dementia, again, brain fog, the mm -hmm. perennial brain fog, which we know only too well firsthand, don't we? Um, mm -hmm. but, but what can people do to um, help with those symptoms? Yeah, okay. So when I'm asked about alternative therapies and HRT, because, because I'm a medical doctor, I'm usually dealing in the realms of HRT or prescribable alternatives. I'm always completely and utterly supportive because management of the menopause, it really, it, it, it is a combination. So hormone replacement therapy for many women is really good for replacing the estrogen and really getting you on the way. And for many women, that might be all that it takes, getting on the right HRT. But I think actually probably for the majority of women, it's not the only key element to managing menopause symptoms and the long term health risks that come from the menopause. So namely heart disease, osteoporosis and particularly for younger women, dementia. So I think if we think about symptoms of the menopause first, you know, just really taking a good hard look at lifestyle changes. So absolutely exercise, there is good evidence that exercise is essential, changing your re regime um, in weight loss. It's really having a good hard look at your diet again, because your metabolism changes as well as we go through the menopause. Making sure there's enough calcium and vitamin D is essential for bone health. Um, and the Mediterranean diet is probably the diet with the most evidence behind in terms of preventing heart disease and increasingly emerging data preventing dementia, also um, one of the facets. So we've got lifestyle and, and then we've got all the alternative therapies that can just enhance also. And just in terms of symptom control, again, you know, I think HRT is a good it sort of helps the build the foundations. But then I was talking to somebody just today who was saying the HRT can really help you get some of the way, but then it's learning again to think positively. It's learning to switch off. It's learning to deal with the anxiety that you've maybe experienced for years in the menopause transition. And that's where I think alternative therapies um, like Carolyn and Davida can offer that can really either be used instead of or alongside HRT. You have to be a little bit careful, which what Davida will tell us about, um, you know, some of the phytoestrogens, plant estrogens, you maybe wouldn't want to take H with HRT, but a lot of the other therapies can really complement. So I, I see it as a whole picture rather than it's either or, it, it's the whole holistic approach that is so essential. Yeah. And, and Claire, I think, um, you know, we, we've been friends for a decade now. And one of the reasons we set up my menopause center together, because it started with, you know, all the brilliant support and help that you gave me. And I can only echo that. And I'm really happy to share my personal experience with that HRT gave me stability, but it, but it wasn't enough in and of itself. So I really had to change my mindset around exercise. I never exercised up until going through the menopause, but really making the time to do that. I see, I, we'll introduce Carolyn in a moment, but I know Carolyn is fabulous. I've been seeing her for acupuncture for many, for many years, and, uh, but also um, mindfulness and meditating. Mm. So I think everybody will find their own way and what works for them. But I think the key point you're calling out is 
it's very often a holistic range of things and really assessing your lifestyle and what works for you and using those tools then to, to help you um, to, to live a, you know, a, a more fulfilling life and, and take control of your symptoms. Um, but uh, so I think this is probably a great bridge. So that was incredibly helpful. And I know Emma's been busy beavering away and posting links to all of the great resource articles that you've written that are up on our website. Um, and, and she'll also, um, I think, include a link to sleep hygiene because I know you've done mm. a, a piece around sleep tips as well. It's yeah. easier said than done, isn't it? When you've got a bunch of hot flushes and night sweats and stuff, but um, there are, you've got brilliant sleep hygiene advice. But maybe then um, over to uh, Carolyn then. So Carly, you really have a, a unique perspective uh, on the world, I think, because you've, you've trained and worked as a GP and, and trained and work as an acupuncturist as well. So maybe just to kick off, because we've had some questions already about acupuncture. If you could maybe just explain what acupuncture is for those who are less familiar with it, how it works and what's the key difference between Western and Chinese acupuncture? Yeah, sure. Um, so acupuncture is one branch of traditional Chinese medicine. Um, the other branch is being herbal medicine, which David will talk about Chinese herbs specifically. Um, moxibustion, which is a herb that we warm the skin with. Cupping, you've seen celebrity cupping marks on the back of, back of their shoulders. Um, qigong, which is a, a simple form of Tai Chi involving the breath, exercise and visualization um, and Chinese nutrition. So there's a lot involved in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, I mainly focus on acupuncture and, and but not herbs specifically because they terrify me. I think they're brilliant, but you need to know what you're doing with them. Um, acupuncture itself is we insert these tiny sterile once only used needles that are the diameter of hairs so I treat lots of needle phobic people nobody runs away screaming I treat babies children um, so they're inserted into very very specific points on the body you don't just throw them like a dart anywhere if you did they've done some studies to see if it would work and it has a general effect so you need to choose a good acupuncture. If you put needles anywhere, you get a bit of endorphin relief, so you'll feel a bit better. But they've now done brain scans and looked at specifically putting acupuncture points in the right place. They have more nerve endings, they have reduced skin resistance, and different areas of the brain actually light up when you're treating the correct area. Um, so it isn't just this random woo-woo. There is some firm evidence now that acupuncture supports certain conditions. Um, so what we're doing is activating the internal organ systems in Chinese medicine. One of the things that attracted me was it, it makes these connections between different organ systems that I could see as a GP, but I couldn't explain. So for me, the menopause is an important chapter in life. It's a chapter where you have many different systems, symptoms involving many different organ systems. So you need, for me, the model is good because I can connect these different symptoms and treat them in a slightly different way. Um, the difference between Western and um, Chinese acupuncture is the doctors got hold of acupuncture and decided it needed to be absolutely evidence-based. So they have a system which they teach to doctors, physios and nurses, which is often called dry needling. Um, they have a two weekend course. It's very limited. It works for pain and certain conditions, but it is prescription based. They don't learn. Oh, I took three years out and did a full time training to learn about the pulse diagnosis, the tongue, the whole system, the philosophy. Uh, I did the Western course and it terrified me again because I didn't understand what I was doing with, with the needles. So um, I'm a bit of an advocate of the traditional model. I have. Um, I also honor that Western acupuncture does work. But I think if you're wanting full holistic support with menopause, I would seek out a, a well-trained traditional acupuncturist. And, and Carolyn, um, where, how, how would one go about finding a well-trained traditional acupuncturist? So um, I'm regulated by the British Acupuncture Council, which is our professional regulatory body. Um, they're international, actually. So you go onto the British Acupuncture Council website. I think Emma's going to post the link and you can search for a practitioner by area. And I would call five of them because it's a very intimate relationship that you develop with your acupuncturist. So you're seeing them one hour. We don't crack your menopause in one treatment. We're not that good. 
So you might be seeing us weekly four times. That's what I usually recommend. And then perhaps I see you monthly or the change of seasons. It's an individual prescription, but you've got to really get on with that person. Ask them questions. They should be able to answer them. Don't be afraid. Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, you are One is quite vulnerable lying there on a table, allowing somebody to put needles in. So I think you're absolutely that chemistry and that um, that trust in your practitioner is so important, Carolyn. Now, we've had a couple of great questions um, come up here about the use of um, acupuncture. And I'll tie it into, um, you know, your experience of using it. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about it. So one is, Carolyn, a question around, is it safe to use acupuncture if you're recovering from breast cancer and you're on tamoxifen? And then there's some other questions around um, acupuncture and joint aches and pains. And is it helpful for that? And now I, I should say, and, and maybe I'm sure you, you can speak um, more, far more knowledgeably than I to this, but the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, um, it only recommends considering acupuncture as a treatment option for chronic or long-term pain, uh, chronic tension type headaches and migraines. Uh, and we'll include a link to the NHS website uh, where they also note that acupuncture is often used to treat musculoskeletal conditions and pain conditions, including joint pain, dental pain, and post-op pain. Um, and some of these, as we know, migraine joint pain in particular can be menopause related. So what, what's your experience, Carolyn, of where you've seen, you know, through your patients in your clinic, um, acupuncture to be a real benefit? With, with specifically with the menopause, most people are coming in and asking for relief from um, hot flushes, insomnia, anxiety, the, the whole list, mood swings. Um, Sometimes it's migraines have suddenly come up or um, loss of libido, lack of energy, brain fog, all the, all the, the, the common list of symptoms. And in fact, um, they're, the, they're the symptoms that people want most support with. And over my observations, about one in 10 people don't respond um, to perhaps the hot flushes. It's a small number that don't respond. Um, most people get a significant reduction. Some people have had miraculous, gosh, I feel fantastic, but we're not adding anything into the body. I'm not putting anything into the needle. So what you have to be aware of is even, and there is some evidence that you can change the levels of um, estradiol and progesterone in the blood. They've, there's some good studies now. Again, if you go to the Acupuncture Council website, you should be able to find that. But you're only shifting them in minute quantities and balancing things. We're not adding anything. So you will have to probably continue acupuncture for support. It's not a wonder cure. It's used, you know, as I say, sometimes I'm seeing people every two, three months after a while, and it will support those symptoms. Um, so there's evidence that we can increase uterine blood flow. So, of course, it can help with people who are really flooding and having terrible period problems around the perimenopause. Um, interestingly, Chinese medicine said that, says that we prepare for the menopause in our 20s, the way we lead our life in our 20s. Now, this is fascinating, I think, because, of course, you don't think about that when you're 20. But certainly, you know, the tank is a little bit emptier. So if you overextend and live hard in your 20s, probably your menopause is going to be uh, more difficult, which is an interesting thing to think about. Could explain a lot, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so joint pains, again, I'm treating people with arthritis anyway. So if, if 10 people came with menopausal symptoms, each one would have an individual prescription, depending on their constitution, their lifestyle, I'm looking at the tongue. So it's a very, very much about that one person. It's not a, a standardized, I don't treat in that way anyway. And I think it's more effective because of that. Yeah, brilliant. And then Carolyn too. So I think that's really clear on, um, the symptoms that people come to you with and what you do and around joint pain and the NHS info which we've posted as well that there are a few different questions here but all along the theme of um, doing acupuncture if you've had uh, breast cancer or if you're on certain um, medication for the treatment of breast cancer what, what are your views on that and again this is where your unique perspective of, of, of western and eastern Chinese um, acupuncture and his approach is really helpful. So if you're going to an acupuncturist who is a herbalist as well, you need to be very, very careful that they're fully qualified in herbs. So I can't talk about that, but David can a little bit. Um, what I would say is acupuncture is generally safe to use in people who are having 
um, even having cancer treatment at the time, I support lots of people um, for chemotherapy, radiotherapy, drugs as well, because as, as I say, we're not adding anything to the body. We're very careful about treating. Um, we don't tend to treat in the arm that's had lymph nodes removed and um, because you are more at risk, at risk of infection in that arm, even though we're using very sterile needles, I wouldn't do that unless somebody was very specifically asking me and knew the risks. But other than that, it should be supporting, um, supporting that process. There's no contraindications to, to that at all. Yeah. And um, the, so as I say, lots of interest and Emma shared the, the links to that. And last question for you, Carolyn, then before we move on to chat to David, um, a, a great question here again on what are your thoughts about acupuncture, uh, acupressure points? as a therapy? So acupressure instead of the needles. Um, I think it's a brilliant thing to do yourself. It's something that I'm looking at even sort of rolling out as a sort of more education thing so that you can carry on doing some treatments at home in between, um, in between treatments. Tweena, our Chinese massage, is acupressure along the meridians and points. I would say the needles are, it's like a, a sort of concentrated effect. So it's a very specific a more concentrated effect. You will get the effect from acupressure, but perhaps not as focused, um, but a very safe, easy thing to do yourself. Absolutely. And I tend to use it on children that are frightened of needles until they have one and they're fine. Um, so, you know, children above baby age, acupressure is really useful. Brilliant. Thank you, Carolyn. Look, that was super, uh, that was really super helpful. Uh, I've seen, um, you can tell from the amount of questions that we've had here. And Emma, thank you for posting all of those links as well. So uh, it's, it's a really good way to transition on your, um, your words of caution around the use of Chinese herbs. And I know when we were all preparing for this event, you and David were chatting about, you know, how people could sometimes think because it's called herbal, it's safe, but these can be quite potent as well. I know, David, this is something that you'd speak to um, in a moment. So thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, and David, thank you for joining us this evening and to help us navigate the world of her herbal treatment and supplements. So you can see from the chat, we've had some questions come in already. And we'll, we look at, I think, with what you're going to share, we'll answer most questions, but the ones that we don't, we look to feed in. Now, um, at the beginning of the webinar, uh, Clara mentioned the importance of a healthy and balanced diet and the Mediterranean diet specifically, so fresh fruit and veg, fish and grains, and a diet rich in vitamin D and calcium. And I know we could easily spend a whole hour on nutrition and supplements alone, but we don't have an hour. Um, but we, yeah, it's the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I know you've done a ton of work, David, to prepare for this. Um, it would be great to hear from you about the herbal remedies that can help with menopause symptoms. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen. So if you are investigating like a uh, herbal solution, I would first of all uh, uh, like uh, recommend to seek for um, expert advice because uh, usually it's, there is this belief that natural remedies are completely safe, but actually they could interact with uh, some medication you're taking or uh, with some health condition you have. Uh, especially when speaking about menopause, um, like uh, interaction with HRT or with other medication or um, a woman who has, a, who has or has had a history of hormone-related cancer should be very careful when choosing uh, the supplements for menopause. Um, as it's a, such a vast um, uh, word, uh, I try to make things a bit easier by dividing and, uh, and dividing this supplement into, into three categories. The first category is the supplements that contain phytohormones, so they, that, they, that show a, um, phyto, usually a phytoestrogenic activity. And so they are the most likely to be um, most similar to HRT because they show a, a mild estrogenic effect on your body. Then uh, the second category is the category of the, of the supplements to support your mental health during menopause. And with this, I mean all uh, these uh, um, symptoms related to your mood, to anxiety, to brain fog or to fatigue. And the third category is uh, um, represented by the supplements who, who don't show any phytohormonal activity, uh, but they are also very helpful for all your menopausal symptoms. Uh, so starting with the uh, uh, ones that, are, that contain phytohormones, they usually contain uh, phytoestrogens that are molecules very similar 
to estrogens in uh, in the body, but of course, um, as opposite to HRT, they have a uh, like a milder and uh, usually also well tolerated effects on the body. Uh, all these supplements must not be taken by all the people who have uh, or have had a, um, a history of uh, hormone-related cancer because they definitely can uh, interact with your um, uh, hormone suppressant therapy. And, and also, as they contain phytoestrogen, they have a phytohormone activity, so they are not recommending for these women. Um, but they could be a good choice, uh, especially when uh, you uh, don't, um, for some reason, you don't want to take HRT, or maybe if you want to come up from HRT, and so you don't want to go cold turkey, we can say, and so you just want to uh, to uh, gently uh, go uh, for the, for your menopausal journey without uh, having a, a stop in uh, the estrogen level in your in your blood. So these, uh, whole, these um, supplements are um, quite popular, and especially I'm speaking about black coosh, which is uh, um, a supplement uh, that could help you with hot flashes and all the menopausal symptoms. Uh, and that is very controversial because some research show that it, it contains phytoestrogens, and some, uh, some other clinical researches show that, they, that it doesn't. But like just to be on the safe side, it must be avoided by all those people uh, who are uh, taking like tamoxifen or hormone suppressant medication. Uh, very important uh, source of phytoestrogens are soy and red clover. These two uh, plants contain isoflavones, which are the most, usually the most powerful uh, phytoestrogen in, um, contained in supplements. Uh, and, but there are uh, some, um, some difference between these two plants. For example, uh, clover uh, has a, a, a um, concentration in isoflavones which is higher than soy. So it, usually it's mostly recommended for the first part of your menopause when you're dealing with, especially with hot flashes and uh, uh, night sweats. While soy is the best choice for the late menopause uh, in order to cope with all these, those long-term um, symptoms like uh, osteoporosis or uh, cardiovascular protection. Uh, soy should not be taken if you're taking like a, a thyroid medication as these could interact with the absorption of this medication. Uh, and red clover should be avoided if you're on a strong anticoagulant therapy. Uh, another source uh, that I really like of uh, phytoestrogen is uh, uh, flax, uh, flaxseed or Norway spruce, which is a type of tree. This plant contain Lignans. Lignans are uh, phytoestrogen that are very likely to help with all the menopausal symptoms, but are also shown, clinically shown, to be uh, protective against uh, breast and hormone-related cancer. Uh, so this could be the best choice uh, as an alternative for HRT if you have a familiarity with this kind of uh, illnesses. But of course, it must be avoided if you already have had uh, uh, hormone related cancer, as uh, in this case, uh, they show uh, uh, phytohormonal activity, which is not recommended in that case. Uh, other, uh, another important herb that contains phytoestrogens is called Shatavari, which is an Ayurvedic medicine plant uh, that is not only uh, a source of phytoestrogens, but is also uh, an, um, a strong adaptogen that, has, um, that could help, especially with low mood, anxiety, but also especially with vaginal dryness. Um, other two herbs that are very popular uh, that contain phytohormones are sage, uh, which is a herb that contains phytoestrogens, and agnoscastus. Agnoscastus contain phytoprogestogens, uh, so um, molecules that are similar to progesterone, the other female hormone, and that is uh, uh, very helpful, especially for um, relaxation and for sleep. Uh, speaking about the supplements that like uh, uh, will help you with your mood, and so will help you with uh, uh, the um, brain fog, with uh, um, like fatigue or with anxiety especially, and also with, uh, with low mood. Uh, uh, there are some of these herbs that, are, that, that still show a phytohormonal activity, so they must not be taken by people with uh, uh, history of, bre of breast or hormone-related cancer, but some of them could be safely taken by these women, 
because they don't have any phytohormonal activity. So speaking about the one with phytohormonal activity, uh, there are two important herbs, which are maca and reishi. Uh, maca is a Peruvian root that uh, will help you with all your menopausal symptoms and that will support your mood, your relaxation, and it's also very, very helpful for sexual desire and libido. So it could be uh, the natural alternative to testosterone, or it could be something to add on top of HRT when uh, you struggle with this problem as well. Um, Oh, maca uh, unfortunately could stimulate your body to produce more estrogen. So for it's not recommended for all those women with estrogen sensitive condition. Um, the other one uh, that I mentioned before is reishi. Reishi is an important medicinal mushroom with us, which has shown uh, a strong hormone, regul um, hormone uh, regular, regulatory activity. Um, this will help with all the menopausal symptoms and uh, especially with low mood, anxiety, sleep, but also with inflammation. So reishi is, uh, could be the best option if you're also struggling with a, a chronic inflammatory condition, like could be uh, joint pain or whatever is inflammatory in your body. Uh, reishi uh, has shown to be also a strong anti-tumoral against breast cancer and um, uterine cancer. But of course, it shows also a phytoestrogen activity. So it, it, it's not usually recommended to, to take when you have a, a hormone-related uh, history of breast cancer. Three herbs that are completely safe if you have had this problem are uh, ashwagandha and rhodiola. These are two ad adaptogens that uh, help with the mood, with fatigue, and also with sexual desire. And, and they also help with brain fog. And, all, both of them have been shown to be protectors against breast cancer, and they can easily taken by and safely taken by uh, women who have had this problem. Uh, the only recommendation is not to take these two herbs, so ashwagandha and rhodiola, if you're on uh, antidepressant or strong anticonvulsivants. And also, ashwagandha is not recommended, especially with in women who suffer from hyperthyroidism because this uh, herb stimulates the thyroid to produce more hormones. Another herb is St. John's wort. St. John's wort is a strong natural antidepressant, but uh, I wouldn't recommend to take it without uh, seeking for medical or professional advice beforehand, because St. John's wort uh, could interfere with lots, and I mean lots of medication, also in a very uh, effective and strong way. Uh, speaking about the supplements that will help you with menopausal symptoms that don't show any phytohormonal activity, so they are completely safe to be taken by uh, women who have or have had history of uh, hormone-related cancer, we can speak about even in primrose and safflower oil, which are uh, oils that contain GLA um, um, or gamma linoleic, linoleic acid, which is a, a, a fatty acid that calms down all your general inflammation and in this way also helps you to calm down uh, your menopausal symptoms. In order to uh, gain these effects, you should take a high daily dose of GLA. Uh, mm, otherwise, it's not effective. Another one that I really like is magnesium. Magnesium is a crucial mineral uh, in your body and it helps to promote sleep, uh, it helps with your anxiety, with low mood, and also increase relaxation and um, uh, the healthy production of a neurotransmitter in your brain. Uh, magnesium is likely to literally uh, calm down all your nervous system. So it's, it's especially indicate, uh, like a, um, um, suitable for you if you are struggling with anxiety due to menopause. And uh, also with, uh, um, it's also actually recommended also in PMS and uh, in cramps or in uh, any, uh, anything that involves the muscle. The best forms to get magnesium are the magnesium bisglycinate or the magnesium torate, because these two forms are the most likely to act directly on, our, on your brain and so on your mood. Other two supplements to be a sea bactone oil, which is uh, very important to moisturize all your body from within. And so it's uh, especially important for vaginal dryness. And ginkgo biloba, which is uh, 
uh, a supplement that will help you to improve your memory and your concentration, but it's highly not recommended, so not suitable for people on anticoagulant therapy. Thank you. So, David, amazing. <laughs> so we had yeah, um, lots, lots of requests um, come in, and I should have said at the top, uh, lots of requests for uh, the names of the various products that you've mentioned. Now, um, we're very fortunate that David is going to write a blog for us summarizing um, and, uh, uh, summarizing and also providing more detail, if that makes sense, um, uh, on all of the um, various products that he just mentioned and the caveats around using them and where you need to be careful, because that, of course, is really important um, mm -hmm. for people to be aware of. So we've had We've had lots of questions come in, and I'm going to circle back to those uh, in a moment. And we had lots of more questions. We had questions come in for Carolyn and uh, lots of questions for Claire as well. So, David, maybe just a last question for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you walk into any pharmacy or health food shop, there are a gazillion different supplements on the shelf. <clears throat> and they might cost two pounds, they might cost 20 pounds, they might cost 40 pounds. How on earth do you know which ones are the best value for money, you know, the right quality at the best price? What are the things that you would recommend people look out for when picking a supplement brand? Okay, so as a general rule, a general rule the first thing that I would recommend to anyone when buying a supplement is to have a look at the label. The label could tell you uh, lots of things about the quality of that supplement. Uh, usually you need to find on the label all the list of the ingredients contained in the supplement and also the concentration of them. And when especially speaking about herbal remedies, you should always find the percentages of the um, active principles contained in each herb contained in the supplement. This is a guarantee of uh, quality and of uh, technical study of the supplement. Also, another important factor could be to uh, seek for um, uh, certification marks on the box of the supplement. Uh, as for example, just to mention one, the traditional herbal registration mark, which is a guarantee of the quality of the supplement and also of the safety of it. But on top of that, like the more uh, certification, certification marks you see on the box, the best supplement you're buying. Uh, yeah. there, is, there, there is a massive difference between supplement price, and I know this, but usually like uh, the supplement that costs more are usually more effective and also more safe. Uh, this is because uh, there is uh, a better quality of raw material. There is usually the absence, uh, certified absence of additives or allergens or uh, toxic contaminants, but also there are controls during manufacturing and uh, uh, the absorption of the ingredients is guaranteed by uh, trademarks or by uh, forms of vitamins that are more um, likely to be absorbed. David, that's brilliant. Yeah. And then I promise this is my last question for now. Then I'm going to go to Carolyn mm -hmm. and then Claire, just to give you a moment to pause, take breath and maybe have a sip of water. But are there any particular brands that you would recommend? Yeah, so there are, I, I really like three brands, which are the pure encapsulation, um, and BioCare for general supplementation and IFAS de Terra for uh, mycotherapy, so for medic medicinal mushrooms. I really like these brands because they are uh, clinical formulas, so they can be uh, recommended and sold only by practitioners. But when dealing with general supplement in a pharmacy or in a health shop in general, I really like also other three brands, which are Solgar, uh, Viridian and Nature's Plus, because they guarantee a high quality uh, standard for the supplements, and they are also represent. Uh, they, they, they are, are, are they are also um, formulas that I studied and uh, represent lots of clinical researches on them. Brilliant, thank you, David. So, uh, you. As, as mentioned, we'll uh, cover all of this in your blog. We look at some of the other questions coming in and make sure that we that we cover those as well, David. But that was super helpful, as you can see from the response. So, Carla, yeah, a quick you. question for you then. Thank you. Um, in our last kind of uh, nine, eight, nine minutes, quick question for you. We've had a great question here, and I'm not sure if you've come across this technique, but uh, one of the one of the folks in our call has asked um, what your thoughts are on EFT, if you have any uh, emotional freedom technique. Yes, yeah, so it's not an official branch of Chinese medicine, so I'm only commenting from 
people I know who are practitioners who have taught it or um, friends that perhaps use it. I think it's a, it's a tapping technique. So it's a combination of certain phrases that are uh, um, talked about while you're tapping certain acupuncture points. All I can say is it's a, it, it, it is really effective for some people, but I can't talk to you as an expert. Yeah. Um, it's safe. You, you can use it for anything. And I think, and some people have great, great results with it, but that's really all I can say. Okay, th thank you for that, Caroline. And as ever, thank you for your absolute authenticity uh, in, in your response, much appreciated. Claire, it's going to be a little bit like Mastermind again. I'm going to fire a bunch of questions at you, but you're well used to this by now. Many of them are about HRT um, and uh, where, where, where you can and can't uh, use it. Um, so uh, one of the uh, questions was around, uh, as you know only too well, um, in some parts of the country, it's not possible to uh, get um, testosterone um, via your GP. So this uh, lady would like to know, uh, where, where can she go to get testosterone privately? Um, so most private menopause clinics, in fact, all of them, I, I would say, will prescribe testosterone off license. And to look for a private clinic close to you. So we are online and so nationwide at my menopause center. But the British Menopause um, Society have a list of all the registered um, specialist menopause clinics. Um, you're right, Helen, and um, there are pockets of GPs um, who will prescribe it now, and I'm sure this will change in time, um, but that would be my recommendation. Sometimes gynecologists will prescribe it if you can get a referral um, through your GP also. Yeah, okay, thank you, Claire. And um, Emma, it might be helpful if you maybe post, we've got a post, uh, a resource article on the website about what it means to have testosterone prescribed off license and how it worked that Claire has written, which is extremely um, helpful. Another quickie here, Claire, uh, from a lady who's been taking Sandrina and Testam, but it's not really helping much. Any suggestions? Oh, I'd have to know more. Don't or was that too? Yeah. yeah, why is, is that, it not helping? Go back and speak to your it? doctor and yeah, speak yeah, to and, and, and speak yeah. to them, yeah. But I think it's it's something I certainly know from personal experience. I had to try about three different approaches to HRT before finding something that really worked. So oh, this is completely. something that you see, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And if the Sandrina hasn't helped or you're not absorbing brilliantly, then maybe a patch, you know, maybe the Lenzetto spray, maybe a different route of delivery. Yeah. So don't despair. Do not despair. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. go back. Yeah. yeah, and don't be shy though. Go back to your doctor. I know, yeah. hassle them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, then uh, th this lady Claire has had a pulmonary embolism last August, and we hope you're you're okay now. And was told to come off HRT, which she loved. Uh, know the feeling and that as well. Feeling the effects of obviously coming off HRT nearly a year later with low mood, anxiety, bad skin, and loss of libido. Any, I, I'm aware you don't have you don't mm. have a medical history and all of that, but in principle, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think this is one of the reasons we're running this evening, isn't it? But to understand the alternatives to HRT, HRT is fantastic for many women, but have a look around at alternatives. Um, HRT is probably not a no. It would just need a discussion with yourself and a menopause specialist um, about your particular condition, why you had the PE. But I mean, I've prescribed HRT as long as you have it through the skin. It's really important that you have transdermal estrogen. So through the skin, um, body identical progesterone has a neutral effect on blood clotting. So it, it would need a discussion with a menopause specialist um, and possibly a hematologist. But, you know, plenty of women out there with PEs have restarted HRT. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. And then we had a question in here around skin being drier. Claire has written a brilliant um, uh, article on the website about if you go to the symptom checker, you'll see all the symptoms there. But there's one on skin, which there might be some good advice in there for you on, on how to, to deal with um, to deal with dry skin. Um, and we've covered back trouble, uh, weight, weight gain perennial issue so I think as you said Claire exercise nutrition um you know all, all of the things that we just mentioned here um d -d -d joint pain so I'm just flicking down through here um yeah I was told to put the testosterone on the inside of my arms I grew masses of black hair like really sorry to hear that on the inside of your arms and had to have laser 
is there a hair free doser actually should it, was it was that correct to apply it on the inside of the arm yeah so um androfem or test it whichever one you, usually um it's put on the thigh or the lower tummy and to avoid getting hair growth where you apply it um i always tell people to move the patch around don't use the same patch daily so use move it around to avoid that very issue i have heard that quite frequently actually yeah yeah okay. Brilliant. And Claire, uh, two excellent questions. All, all the questions are brilliant, but these you, I know you hear a lot and it's so important to get the facts out there. Uh, this lady has asked, is it dangerous to take HRT for a long time? She's been taking it for 25 years. Um, as long as you, so you'll be having the benefits of HRT as long as you continue to take it. So protection of your cardiovascular system, protection of the bones, the risk of breast cancer does increase by a small amount year on year. It's still likely to be low depending on yourself. It's still, you know, lifestyle factors can be more important than HRT. We don't have a lot of data except to say we know the risk of breast cancer increases with length of time that you take HRT for. But plenty of women carry on taking it. You know, there is a black hole of data. Um, for older women that will hopefully improve out with years to come. But I would support anybody who wants to continue to take it. Good. That was really clear. Claire, thank you. Now, when I know you'll definitely have a view on this, this lady, uh, Liz says, I was told that HRT was not something you could take when you're going through the perimenopause. Is that correct? Shall I, I breathe? Know. Three deep yes. breaths. <laughs> breathe, breathe deeply. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so absolutely, HRT can support your perimenopause. Yeah, you can yeah. start it if you're still having periods. Yeah, and then, yeah, there's so much misinformation about this. So thank you um, for, for that. And then um, do, 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 I think we've covered most of the, yeah, so this is a good, a really good question to, to finish on, I think, for you, Claire, and then I'll come to David. And David, it'll be slightly mastermind-like because we're into the last minute. Lots of questions for you, David, but I think we'll pick up a lot of them in the blog and I'll, I'll focus on, on, on some of the key ones. Claire, is it safe to take plant estrogens post breast cancer and when you're on tamoxifen? Yeah, so that's interesting. So if you're on tamoxifen, it will be blocking the estrogen receptors in the breast. It's very good at that. The honest answer is we don't know. There is very little data. And so we just don't know if it's safe. Plant estrogens are weak estrogens, but we just don't have enough information on, um, on safety. So it, it's proceed with caution. I don't think I could fully answer that just because the evidence is not out there. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Um, so again, just ha have a conversation with a specialist, I suppose. Mm. Um, Absolutely, and then yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I promise the last question, but it's so topical. So as, as we know, on the most recent Channel 4 programme with Dafina McCall, the, the, another great programme about menopause, there was a very big focus on the impact of taking HRT on dementia, cognitive function, brain fog and so on. So um, th this uh, uh, participant here, a, a great question around, she's saying she's trying to manage symptoms via nutrition, but wonders if she's missing a trick and possibly avoiding dementia because of the lack of estrogen caused by menopause. Yeah, so younger women, so women in their early 40s, younger than 40, there is evidence. So the evidence is quite clear that take, starting HRT, starting estrogen can help. It's just one thing that can help pre prevent dementia. Women going through the menopause at a standard age, it might be helpful, but the evidence is not clear. I have to say it's I, I usually describe it as murky um, it, it's unlikely. Well, we know that it's not going to increase your risk of dementia. It might be helpful, particularly vascular dementia, um, as estrogen helps keep the blood vessels clean. Um, I think it's a very individual one-on-one -on -one discussion. It, it's very difficult to generalize. It would depend on age and circumstances and other risk factors. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, not Brilliant. to be clear enough, but no. young age, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Look, Claire, I think we've had lots of great questions in here, um, again, about HRT. So I just wonder when we come back from the summer holidays, maybe in September, we might do another event on HRT to do a bit of a deep dive on it and bust um, you know some of the myths that are that are still out there 
David, I'm going to ask you two questions before we close and all the other questions that have come in. I think you've covered a lot of them and I'm really confident that in your blog, you'll address them. Um, so last couple of questions for you. Can you take too much of a supplement? Can you take too much vitamin D, calcium, magnesium, and so on? Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, even if you take too much water, you can have a, uh, like, it, it could be a toxic for you. So um, uh, for sure, there are a range, those, uh, like, uh, those ranges for supplements. So usually, for example, speaking about magnesium, you should take uh, 400 milligrams per day to get a good effect on your mood. But like when you take more than that, you're likely to um, like a, um, to give a, a bit of problem to your kidneys because of course you have to flush out all the, all the excess of magnesium. But this helps with everything, also with vitamin C. Uh, usually you just have to follow the recommendations that are on the label. Uh, sometimes uh, when uh, you're seeking for professional advice, uh, some... Uh, you can also be told to take a bit more than what uh, that what uh, like uh, told on the on the on the label, but never too much. Yeah. Okay. No. That that's very clear, David. And then, how long should you take? How long should can you expect to wait before you see the beneficial impact of any supplements that you're taking? Oh, it really depends on the supplements. So there are supplements that we, that are very very quick to 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 kick in. And usually adaptogens are like that. So um, ashwagandha, no, 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 maybe rhodiola, reishi, uh, maca could, after one week, you can already can see some results. Uh, regarding phytoestrogens, so regarding like uh, the supplements for menopause that are, will help with, uh, to, 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 to be similar to HRT, uh, usually like you have the, complete effect after after one or two months of treatment but like it really depends on the on the person some people could have also uh, great benefits after the, the the first days of treatment so it really depends on the supplement brilliant thank you and i think we'll if we if we draw a line at that david there there are more questions in there um but mm. a huge huge engagement in understanding the uh, prescribable alternatives to HRT. So thank you so much, Claire, for sharing all of your expertise in that on acupuncture as an approach and as an additional tool in your armory to, to help you through menopause. And that we might persuade Carla to um, find some time to write a blog about acupuncture as well and how it can help and how it can be used. And uh, we'll, of course, share Carla's details in the email that will be sent out at the end of the week with a video to the link. And again, a huge thank you to David. We'll also share David's details and um, for those of you that have, everybody here is obviously registered for the event, we'll send out a note um, regarding when the blog has been posted with a link to it to make sure that you don't miss out on it. But if you if you signed up to our newsletter or if you follow us on social media, we'll post about it then and we'll include it in the newsletter. But we'll put an extra step in to make sure nobody, uh, nobody misses out on anything. So uh, again, a huge thank you to our brilliant panel of experts. They did uh, an, an enormous amount of work in the background to prepare for this evening to make sure we shared with you the best possible knowledge and expertise about alternative approaches to managing the menopause apart from the HRT. So thank you so much. And Aideen, thank you for partnering with us. And back to you now to close the event. And of course, a big thank you to Emma for posting so furiously through, throughout. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I, you've said it all really, Helen. It's been such an amazing event. So incredibly interesting, fabulous panelists and tons and tons of information. It feels like there's way, way more we could cover here this evening. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So thank you all. Thank you to everyone who's joined us, to the panelists. Um, just to remind you all that the event was recorded, so it will you can access it again if you had, didn't catch all the information, but we will be sharing the links with you after the event. Um, and all these events that we have partnered with My Menopause Center on will be available on Restless and on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can access this as well as our previous events. So finally, thanks to My Menopause Center as always to the amazing panel, of course, to all the Restless members and to everyone else who joined this evening um, and for sharing your amazing comments and questions with us all. So enjoy the rest of your evenings and good night and thank you very much. <laughs>